This is Power Hour with Gabriella Power. Hello and welcome to Power Hour. There is so much to get into as we get closer to the US election. But first, can we take a moment to take a look at what the president is up to? Joe Biden only has a couple of months left of running the most powerful country in the world. And while America is facing a cost of living crisis, a housing and immigration crisis, and there are multiple wars raging on in the world, how is the commander in chief choosing to spend his precious time? Well, in true Joe Biden style, he's at the beach in Delaware. There he is, chilling out on a beach chair under an umbrella, almost like he doesn't have a care in the world. This was the 81-year-old pictured on Wednesday, and according to reports by the New York Post, he spent two hours there with Jill Biden and her sisters. Now, seeing as he needs to go to bed at 8 o'clock every night, it's a fair bit of time to be spent staring at the ocean. But, hey, most Democratic supporters would rather ignore this and instead share TikToks of Kamala Harris pretending that the current vice president will change America. Now, on to one of the biggest stories of the year, one that Democrats and the left-wing media would like you to forget, that Donald Trump was shot and nearly killed six weeks ago. And what do we know about the shooter, Thomas Matthew Crooks? Essentially, not much. The FBI has today released new photographs of the gun used in the shooting that left one person dead, as well as the backpack and explosives found in his car. The FBI also revealed the shooter's internet searches and they confirmed that he engaged in attack planning. Well, thank you for stating the obvious, but how did this happen and what was the shooter's motive? The FBI still hasn't got a clue. And how on earth is that good enough? We'll get into what Donald Trump has had to say about whose fault this is later in the program, but I want to bring in independent journalist Brittany Hopper, who joins us from Florida. Brittany, thank you so much for joining us on A Power Hour. I am fed up with the lack of detail and transparency around this horrific incident, but I want to get your thoughts on the, the new and very basic details that are starting to come out. First of all, thank you so much for having me on. I mean, this is unbelievable. This is the FBI, and they've admitted that they have had, they've conducted a thousand interviews, yet we're still left with so many questions. And I think the biggest question that we all need to be asking is what is taking so long? What is taking so long with this investigation? The other question that we need to be asking is how did this lunatic even get on top of this roof in the first place? Um, there, of course, are so many other questions surrounding this, but this is the FBI. They, they should have had this handled and wrapped up, and we should know way more than what we do know. This was an attempted assassination mm -hmm. on a former president, a current pr man who's running for president again. I mean, this is just unbelievable that... Um, that we are left, the American people are left with so many questions. Absolutely. I completely agree with you. It's unbelievable. They're quick to rule out that he acted alone, yet we don't know why or we don't know how. We have to stay on top of this story, as you say, unbelievable. Vice President Kamala Harris has agreed to her first interview since becoming the Democratic presidential nominee almost 40 days ago. And uh, does her team trust her to do the interview all by herself? No, they don't. She has to be accompanied by Vice President nominee Tim Waltz. And will it be a hard-hitting interview by CNN's Dana Bash? This is the kind of thing that is playing out all over conservative media. I just want to do a little bit of... Uh, Record correcting, Harris was um, put in charge, as you said earlier, of combating the roots of immigration. She was not and is not the border. I've seen a lot of statements from veterans, including those you served with, saying it's just untoward to be criticizing somebody who served for 24 years. It's no wonder she secured the interview. Brittany, what are you expecting from this? So look, um, I, I was a TV journalist for 18 years for mainstream media, for CBS News in Los Angeles um, for well over a decade. And um, I, I can tell you this now, um, after covering the BLM riots here in America and then COVID, um, what I'm seeing now is uh, less journalism and more activism by mm. these journalists that we're seeing on mainstream media. And it has become so blatantly biased 
that it is unfair to the American people. And I've said this repeatedly, but the biggest threat in America right now is the West, the liberal media, uh, the mainstream media. And um, this is gonna be hugely problematic. I don't trust her interview. I question whether uh, the questions will be given to her prior. I'm, I'm confused as to why he's gonna be there with her. Here we have this strong, independent woman running for president, and yet you have to have a man sitting next to you while answering the questions. We know that Kamala Harris isn't that great off the cuff. Everything mm. has to kind of teleprompter, scripted. And so, I mean, this will be an interesting interview, but I am very tempted to say that this is going to be very structured and planned, and she's going to know the answers because she can't really ad lib. Yeah, and it's not going to be done live, so that's an advantage for her. But as you say, I don't know why she can't do it by herself. Look, we did this last week, but there are just more and more Kamala Harris supporters every day being caught out that they actually have no idea why they like her. What is Harris's biggest accomplishment to date as vice president? I don't know. I don't feel comfortable doing this anymore. She, uh, she's... She's, uh, uh, was, uh, uh, vice president. she was a very good vice president. Hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, getting to vice president. <laughs> I have to do more research on her, honestly. Um, I'm just, I don't know, I'm just glad to see a woman, a woman of color in charge for once. That's it. Uh, <laughs> I haven't followed her political career that closely. That's a good one. I don't know. Brittany, you can't really blame them. To your point about the left-wing media, how it's been so dangerous in the role that it plays. And look, I can't really think of one reason why I like Kamala Harris either. What are your thoughts listening to that? I mean, it's, I can't help but laugh. It's comical, right? Um, it's the epitome of so many people in, in our country right, right now in America, given the politics. And, and those people who were being interviewed, they're not like, they're not young. They're, they, mm. I mean, they should fully know what's going on in the political climate, given that we're, what, 69, 68 days away from our election. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not surprised, though, unfortunately. And, um, you know, again, I think with social media and the way people are getting their news nowadays, they're just really reading the headlines and they're not really reading the actual stories, just like how Kamala is spewing her policies, but yet we're not really understanding, well, how are you going to implement those policies? So the American people are just hearing the nuts and bolts, the headlines of, and how mainstream media is really making her look so perfect and great. Um, so yeah, I'm not too surprised by some of these answers, but it's 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 frightening to, to, to think that they're just gonna be blindly voting for someone that they can't even say, what is she known for? What has she done for our country as a vice president? Again, um, all of these things that she's saying she's going to do, well, let me just tell you, in the last 16 years, for 12 of those years, a Democrat's been in our White House. So we haven't seen a lot of change. I mean, we need change. Yeah. The fact that people keep saying, oh, she's going to make, she's going to create all this change. Well, why didn't they the last four years and why haven't they years prior? So I don't know. It's, 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 it's frightening to see so many people be so ignorant about this. It's the most frustrating message that I keep hearing here in Australia, seeing it online, vote for Kamala Harris for change as if she isn't, isn't already the vice president. And as we know, Kamala has just been riding the waves of vibes and she hasn't really been clear on policy. In fact, she's been flip-flopping. It's been revealed, according to Axios reports, that Kamala Harris will spend hundreds of millions of dollars on the border wall along the southern border, something that she has previously opposed and even criticised Donald Trump for, calling it un-American. He has held up the United States government and its workers around his vanity project called a wall. We cannot continue to have an administration and a president of the United States who puts his vanity projects ahead of the needs of the people of our country. This administration has decided to vilify them and to trade on them for the sake of this president's medieval vanity project called a wall. Brittany, is this her style, just to gaslight Americans and then steal Trump's policies? So I don't think it's just her style. I think it's the Democrat Party. And I think that this is very planned out and they're doing this on purpose to try and get the independent voters to 
make her look like she's more of a moderate, but we know that she is as far left as you can possibly go. But I think that they are, sure, let's use the word gaslighting. They are uh, trying to convince otherwise, but we know, we know that this is not the case. Um, we have it on, on record, what you just showed. Um, so she's she's backtracking. She's she's saying things that I I, I don't know. It, it's very confusing, um, and um, I, I'm shocked that the American people um, that 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 the race is this close. Yeah, let's take a look at the Trump campaign. He's released a new ad taking aim at Kamala Harris, pointing out what should be obvious to most Americans that the cost of living crisis that uh, Americans are experiencing right now is a result of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris's leadership. I'm Donald J. Trump, and I approve this message. Everyday prices are too high. Food, rent, gas, back to school clothes. That is called Bidenomics. A loaf of bread costs 50% more today. Ground beef is up almost 50%. There's not much left at the end of the month. Bidenomics is working. The price of housing has gone up. It feels so hard to just be able to get ahead. And we are very proud of Bidenomics. What do you make of the ad, Brittany? Do you think it's going to cut through? Um, it, I hope so. I mean, it's very true. Bidenomics is obviously not working. Um, I Look, here's what I think. I think that those who are going to be voting for Kamala, we're not going to be able to change their minds. Those mm. who are going to be voting for Kamala, we're not going to be changing their minds. Right now, it comes down to some key states here in America um, who wins what and the independent voters, the ones that are still undecided. Um, this is huge, though. I mean, the economy is obviously on everyone's minds, the border, security, inflation. Uh, eggs are like $10 a carton. So, I mean, everything she's saying is absolutely true, yet it's still nothing has changed in the past three and a half, almost four years. She and Biden have been in office. So um, hopefully people see through this hypocrisy because this is the definition of the Democrat Party. Hypocrite. That's what they <laughs> yeah. are. Oh, gosh, I'm waiting and waiting to see more and more people realise this. Look, I'm looking forward to see Donald Trump debate Kamala Harris. It's certainly going to be better than debating Joe Biden. Um, Donald Trump revealed this week that he had, in his words, reached an agreement with the radical left Democrats for a debate with comrade Kamala Harris on ABC News. He said that the rules will be the same as the last CNN debate, which seemed to work out well for everyone except for perhaps crooked Joe Biden. What are you expecting will come from this debate? <laughs> I mean, I'm planning to play a drinking game, to be honest, while watching this, because how many times does Kamala give us a word salad and just left like, huh? Yeah. What? Wait, again? Wait what did you just say? Um, here, here's the thing, though, is that I do think that they are prepping her, mm. and I, I'm not quite sure if Trump is prepping as as hard as she is. Um, I, I do think he's going to take this, though. Um, I, I really, truly do, because he's a beast. And um, we've seen her when she goes off the cuff, and she really just doesn't make sense. And so I, I think he's going to go hard. Um, I hope he's practicing, because I'm, I'm pretty much 99.9% .9 sure that they have her, you know, they're going to give it her the, her all in this debate, but I cannot wait. Um, this debate is going to be huge for the American people in deciding for those undecided voters. And so this is this is a big night for Trump to really, really uh, take the home run here and and do well. If he doesn't do well, um, it's not going to look good for him. So yeah. I think it's going to come down to this debate. This is this is a, a, a really big deal. And I just hope that ABC News keeps it unbiased. I'm not convinced that they won't, but let's see. Um, hopefully the rules will apply and um, yeah, we'll have a good debate because this is what America is all about and let's see what happens. It is certainly going to be crucial and good luck for your drinking game because as we know, Kamala Harris <laughs> will make some gas when she goes off script, but we'll wait and see. Look, things are moving quickly on the campaign trail. Just in the last week, we saw RFK Jr. drop out to endorse Donald Trump. And then we saw just a few days later, former Democrat Tulsi Gabbard come out to say why she's no longer supporting the Democrats and is endorsing Donald Trump. Why are we seeing this? Why are we seeing this trend? We're seeing more and more prominent Democrats rejecting the party. 
I think because, you know, the far left liberal movement, they have basically hijacked the Democrat Party. So I think we're seeing more and more Democrats leaning. I look at it this way, um, and I don't consider myself a far right conservative at all, but I think that the Republican Party over the years, they have moved closer to being more moderates, mm. where the Democrat Party has moved closer to being left-wing loony nut jobs. So, you know, that's the biggest difference that we're seeing right now. And I really do think that the Dem Democrat Party is not what my parents, even though my parents were never Democrats, but it's not what it used to be. It's now this far left liberal yeah. gender identity let's, you know, um, um, party. And I think a lot of people are frustrated. And so um, that's why we're seeing more and more Democrats. I, th th and I, I have a feeling that we're going to see even more um, based off these two joining forces with yeah. Donald Trump. I think you're right and I, uh, in every way. Um, finally, I said this in my editorial, but U.S. President Joe Biden has jetted off to the beach in Delaware after enjoying several days in California's wine country. Brittany, I suppose this is, be, is to be expected. Everyone already looks at him as if he's retired, as if he's just an old grandpa that we need to be nice to when he doesn't make any sense. But how embarrassing is this for America? Well, who's running our country? Yeah, great question. It's the national threat to our country. We, we know that millions of people millions of illegal immigrants have been allowed in. We we know that some of those have been terrorists. What an op opportune time right now, God forbid, to have a terrorist attack on our soil when literally our president is out to lunch. So I, I don't know who's running this country. You have Kamala campaigning, you have President Biden right there and people blowing him kisses. And, <laughs> you know, a man his age should be doing this, at, yeah. you know, at, at this point. In, in his condition, he should be doing this. But he is the president of the United States of America. And uh, there's a lot happening right now. There's a lot going on. And I just question our national security at this point. Brittany Hopper, independent journalist, joining us from Florida. Thank you so much for joining us on Power Hour. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it's no secret that big tech companies like Meta have been censoring critical information to its users for years. And this week, we finally heard from Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg admitting it. He revealed that Facebook bowed to pressure coming from the Biden-Harris administration in a letter to the House of Judiciary Committee Chairman Jim Jordan. Mark Zuckerberg said that the White House repeatedly pressured our teams for months to censor certain COVID-19 content including humour and satire, and expressed a lot of frustration with our teams when we didn't agree. He said that this pressure was wrong and says that he regrets that we were not more outspoken about it at the time. He said that we made some choices that, with the benefit of hindsight and new information, we wouldn't make today. Well, who on earth believes that? But the pressure he speaks about sounds a lot like bullying, which adds up when you look at Kamala Harris's track record of staff who leave as soon as they can. Now, it's not just COVID content that Facebook was ordered to censor. The social media company censored a massive story the New York Post broke about criminal evidence that was found on Hunter Biden's laptop. Now, four years later, Mark Zuckerberg admits that Facebook should not have done that. I'm sorry, Mark Zuckerberg, but the damage has been done. There are still people who associate that story with Russian disinformation and there's not a bone in my body that trusts him anymore. And I know I'm not alone in saying that. Just look at the reaction on X. Dozens of people are labelling him a snake, a fraud. There are even calls for him to be put behind bars. Joining me in the studio is Boss Lady, CEO and founder of Small Business Women Australia... Amanda Rose, <laughs> lovely, to, lovely to speak with you. What do you make of what Mark Zuckerberg had to say? I think he's a coward. Mm -hmm. I think to say, oh, sorry, I was pressured into doing this. Pressured into what? Into literally um, encouraging and being a part, actually facilitating hate on social media, misinformation about people's lives and livelihoods. And remember, this is during COVID. This is when people were making a choice whether they should inject themselves with something and they so they wanted to do their research and so they were genuinely looking for that. And if anyone said anything outside of what was approved by the government or by the globalists, it was like, no, we've got to shut it down. Mm -hmm. That's unacceptable. And it's 
also a really good sign for the everyday person to stop believing what you see online. Mm -hmm. You know, just because it's, you know, the majority online says one thing doesn't mean other things aren't being blocked. That's right. So it's, but he should be punished for this, absolutely. But I think he's freaking out. I think he thinks Trump's going to get in. And so if he does and he realises that you were a big part of the misinformation and the, the hate, the divisiveness that was created during COVID was horrific. And that's why if anything, if, if anything like that happens again, we need to shut these places down and not use them. Yeah, I think that what he did really added to the social divide that we all yes. saw, we all experienced. Yes. So is that your assessment of the timing of this? We're getting closer to the, to the election. So this is why we've all, all of a sudden <laughs> we're seeing this letter. Yeah, people are starting to panic. Oh, no, I think Trump might win, so let's be on the good side here so I don't get too arrested. Late. Or It is too late. And to say I, I was pressured, you have a responsibility. You handpicked. It's the boss. Exactly. And it's not pressure. I'd like to know if there's a... I always say follow the money. I'd like to see if there's a, there's a connection to money in some capacity there, whether it's through grants or tax breaks or so forth, because you don't just say to the government, OK, I'll do what you say because I feel pressured. There's usually a financial incentive with that. But you have a massive responsibility. But, yes, he's freaking out because I think Trump would... Well, not just Trump, actually, maybe RFK, because he was trying to push that information that got He blocked. was. Very much. And now we look back and think, actually, he was right about a lot of it. We're going to talk about RFK Jr. in just a moment, but I want to get your thoughts on Pavel Durov. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, but bear with me. We all know who he is. He's the founder of the messaging app Telegram. He's been arrested and charged in France as authorities make further investigations into alleged criminal activity on the encrypted messaging app, including child abuse material and drug trafficking. Amanda, some are welcoming this. Others say that this is an attack on free speech and this is an overreach of power. What are your thoughts? I'd say it's an attack on the fact that it's the only platform that you could actually communicate that misinformation we just talked about that yeah. Facebook was blocking. Telegram was sharing it. Right. Telegram allows people to communicate all different types of information, research, thoughts, opinions, kind of what it's supposed to be like, right? Freedom of speech, but also factual information. And what's interesting is that they can say to someone, there's child trafficking, you know, happening on this, really? So they can't get rid of porn and child porn off the internet. They can't get rid of that with, you know, Facebook and they've been responsible for sharing images. Google could be responsible. All these other places are responsible, but they're targeting the one platform that has been the biggest supporter of free speech through the last, say, five years. Fair point. Look, it's been around six weeks since Donald Trump was shot in the face, and all, face rather, almost killed on mm. live television. And what have we learnt today? A bit about the gunman's search history, as well as a photograph of a backpack and some information that doesn't really tell us anything about what the heck actually happened that day and how on earth the Secret Service failed so badly to keep Donald Trump safe. Now, it's interesting, Donald Trump has praised the people who kept him safe that day, but he was a little bit more critical during this interview with Dr Phil. You know, when this happened, people would ask, whose fault is it? I think to a certain extent it's Biden's fault and Harris's fault. And... I'm the opponent. Look, they were weaponizing government against me. They brought in the whole DOJ to try and get me. They weren't too interested in my health and safety. They were making it very difficult to have proper staffing in terms of Secret Service. Amanda, is he right? What do you make of what he had to say? I think he's right. And the thing is, they always say America's the leaders of the free world and, you know, it's a safe country and then something like that happens and then there's this confusion over how and who and what. But, yes, it is the responsibility of the administration. But it is such a setup. And I have... What worries me is so many things are happening in plain sight right now, right on live TV, and then people will just say, oh, no, it was an accident, oh, no, it was that person over there, and just walk away. We, as a people, need to push harder and yeah. question more. I think we've been desensitised. I think we've been 
just give up, especially during COVID when we tried to push and ask questions. People said, just don't bother, you'll yeah. get hated on. I think we need to bring that back. We need to push harder and say, well, no, that's an unacceptable response from the government. We want to know more. It can't be what it looks like. There needs to be more there. Yeah, I completely agree with you. It's just wild to me that he was almost killed six weeks ago and so many people just want to forget that it ever happened. We can just focus on TikToks for Kamala Harris. Yeah. Look, <laughs> massive news over the weekend as we witnessed a Kennedy endorse Donald Trump. RFK mm. Jr. says that he wants to make America healthy again after he dropped out of the race and, of course, lost his Secret Service protection. But he says that he and Donald Trump will investigate corruption in regulatory agencies while addressing the rise in chronic diseases in the United States. States. What do you make of his move? Look, I love it, but what he's up against are the pharmaceutical companies, which a majority which uh, are just, you know, pushing drugs to make money, right? And the government's usually involved in that, saying, yes, 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 we'll, we'll support that or we'll make sure that that legislation gets through. So he's going to be fighting a lot of people within government, a lot of large companies that have pretty much gotten away with a lot. So he's taken them to court. I think people have forgotten that. RFK has a reputation of taking pharmaceutical companies and other big corporations who ruin the environment to court and won. So if he's coming in, that's who he'll target. And they're the ones that usually don't like being targeted and can react in a very vicious way. So I'm all for it and I think it's great. Maybe this is the turning point that everyone's prayed for, mm. that we might have a focus back on healthy lifestyle, healthy eating, Be great. healthy mental health, you know, bring back hope, um, bring back the small business, bring back the family unit um, to work together as a community. That would be refreshing. Well, the left-wing media has been in meltdown over uh, RFK Jr's endorsement of Donald Trump and they haven't even tried to hide it. Just take a look at CNN cutting off its live coverage of RFK Jr as soon as he mentioned that Kamala Harris hasn't done an interview. They would be astonished to learn of a Democratic Party presidential nominee who, like Vice President Harris, has not appeared in a single interview or an unscripted encounter with voters for 35 We've days. We've been listening to independent candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. from Phoenix uh, outlining what uh, led him uh, to his quixotic quest for the White House. Oh, interesting timing. And here's CNN's commentary of the historic event. This was cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. <laughs> and trying to get any logic out of that is good luck with that. Um, because it's one, you can't understand what he says. Two, if you can, you can't understand what he says. And I'm reminded of a line of in uh, Mel Brooks's Blazing Saddles when somebody gets up and gives an indecipherable speech, he says, who can argue with that? That's authentic frontier gibberish. And that's exactly <laughs> what that is. Amanda, are you surprised? Not surprised, but you know what's really annoying? These are grown men, mm. right? Willing to follow a really foolish script to keep their job, to push it something that's just... I mean, the language is actually just so ridiculous. Are they threatened by RFK's truth or his masculinity? <laughs> I don't know what it is, but grow up and speak the truth or say nothing at all. Yeah, I right? think they're threatened by the truth. Absolutely. You just listen to what RFK Jr had to say. It was such a powerful speech. Simple. The truth is always so simple, yet it scares so many people. Maybe it, it should be an opportunity for people to say, OK, whether I like or dislike the guy, he Maybe is listen. The, yeah, listen. And it's OK to change what you originally thought because you were potentially brainwashed by the propaganda that Facebook just admitted that they allowed. Yeah, absolutely. I think when you see someone who's been a Democrat, who comes from one of uh, the most famous political Democratic yeah. family in yeah. the United States, yeah. is actually raising the alarm and saying why he needs to endorse Donald Trump, maybe you should actually listen to what he has to say. Exactly. And just because he endorsed Donald Trump doesn't mean he has to like everything about him. Absolutely. It's about, I like that he's going to help bring back the economy and because a lot of the Democrats are rich and elite, they have no idea what it means to not be able to put food on the table. So we really shouldn't be listening to anything they say. Amanda Rory, thank you so much for joining us on Power Thanks. Hour. We are less than 10 weeks away until Americans cast their vote and the latest Fox News poll shows Kamala Harris is closing the gap with Donald Trump in the Sun Belt states in an average of four battleground states, including Arizona, Georgia, Nevada and North Carolina. Kamala Harris leads Donald Trump as preferred president by one point. 
50% to 49%. Let's bring in Michael Kroger, Sky News contributor. Michael, thank you for joining us. What do Pleasure. you make of the polls at this point in the election? Well, look, this is an even money bet. It's a 50-50 bet right as we speak. It depends on Harris. It depends on how her interview goes on CNN in the next few days. It depends on whether she does other interviews. It's to whether people work out that she's not all that good. You know, Trump is a defined character. Everyone knows exactly who he is, what he stands for and what he's mm. like, for good or bad. They didn't know anything about her as vice president. Um, Americans are just waking up to Kamala Harris. Don't forget... Americans didn't even know that Biden had dementia until the CNN, until the, until the presidents were debating against Trump. So unless you're watching very, this program, unless you're watching this program, um, Fox News in America or um, GB News in England, you had no idea this bloke had dementia, which just shows you how uninformed so many people are in America. Yeah. Most people know nothing about Harris. Um, when she's been asked about, you know, her achievements, people have had no idea. They know nothing about her. And all they've seen over the last month, Gab, is this this laughing, friendly, nice woman who the you know hard left media speak well of. That's all I know about her. And until such time as she's been subject to a number of interviews where people realise, hang on, this is pretty much an empty suit. Uh, this this person can't be president of the United States of America. She's going to continue to do well in the polls because um, mm -hmm. you know it looks good, sounds good, but isn't good. So well, that CNN debate is critical. Absolutely. Well, we might see that change because she is going to give her first interview after 40 days of being the nominee tomorrow. How do you think she'll go? Well, look, um, <laughs> look what she's doing. She's doing an interview with the least watched cable news network in America. As we know, Fox have got, what, two, three million viewers. Uh, MSNBC have got a bit over a million. CNN have got 600,000. So it's got the lowest ratings um, she's doing a pre-recorded interview, pre-recorded, mm. which allows them to edit it, and she's taking on the vice president. You couldn't have a bigger security blanket than all of those three things put together. So how will she go? Um, he, he will interrupt her. He'll take up, you know, a third or half of the time. They are trying to protect her with a friendly audience, a pre-record, and him on the stage as well. No, what she needs is an interview with a serious journalist who's going to ask her the hard questions about yeah. her record, about her policies, etc. So even though uh, under under extreme pressure, the Harris campaign have buckled and said, of course, we have to give an interview. Imagine in Australia or England, if if if, if the Prime Ministerial candidates weren't giving interviews on a daily or every second day. I mean, in Australia uh, and in other Western countries, this wouldn't be tolerated. People no. would laugh at the thought that you can hide someone for 40 days running from the most powerful office in the world. So... If she does more and more interviews, then her vote will continue to de will decline, right? The gloss will come off, she will decline and Trump will win. So they've been hiding her. Everyone, everyone on the inside knows they've been hiding her and they've yeah. done an excellent job so far. Well, speaking of hiding people, President Joe Biden's missing. He's been spotted tanning at the beach. Look, he's almost at the end of his presidency. Why is he taking time off now? <laughs> Well, of course, he probably doesn't have much to do. Um, he hasn't been running America for these last three and a half years. We know that. I mean, sad though it is, he's in mental decline, as everybody knows, and uh, he's just having a bit of a holiday. But um, basically, his staff have been running the country for three and a half years. Who knows who they are? But they've been running the joint for three and a half years. Yeah. She's clearly not doing any work. She's running for president. So uh, America's just sort of on autopilot at the minute for the next... Uh, for the next six months until this presidential election is resolved, Gab. No, it's laughable, but then it's 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 not funny because it's no, quite dangerous. Sad. Absolutely. Sad. And look, it's sadly this hasn't taken very long to get going again. What we're seeing at elite American colleges, once again, they are becoming places for anti-Semitic messages to be promoted. Anti-Israel activists used red spray paint to deface a building at Cornell University in New York City, uh, in New York, I should say, while massive protests were held on the first day of class. This is just the start of the college year. Are you concerned that we might see an escalation like we saw these protests turn quite violent just a few months ago? Yeah, there probably is. There are going to be more demonstrations, but they this one seemed to be much smaller, and I think you'll find at the other colleges they're smaller because, look, let's... 
racists. These are left-wing racists. They're the worst type of people who support the oldest hatred in the world, the hatred of Jewish people. We can call it anti-Semitism, and they say they're pro-Palestinian, they're anti-Netanyahu. No, these people hate Jews, right? They are racists. And that's what their parents and friends of others have worked out. As they've gone around over the last few months and people have said, why are you involved in this Jewish hating demonstrations? Some of these young people have started to realise this is not just not such a good thing to be associated with. Um, we're being accused of being Hamas supporters. We're being accused of being anti-Semitic. They don't know any Palestinians. This is just the hard extreme left venting their anger at Western culture, Western society, and because Israel part of the Western alliance, they attack Israel, right? None of these people... Where, where are they supporting the Ukraine? Where are they saying that the Ukraine will be free? None of them. Not one of them, right? This is just Jewish hatred, anti-Western hatred. And as I said, the demonstration will be smaller because so many of these young people are now realising this is not a cause they should be supporting. They are just expressions of hatred of Jews, you know, uh, camouflaged in this, oh, we're for Palestinian rights. Well, no, they're not. They just hate Jews. They can't explain what type of government there would be. They call for the destruction of Israel and the killing of Jews by yelling that from Palis from, from the river to the sea, which is just a disgusting phrase. Uh, no, these people are doing themselves a lot of damage and the stain on their racism and Jewish hatred will live with them forever, Gab. Let's look at the conflict in the Middle East. Israeli forces rescued a 52-year-old hostage from the tunnels in Gaza. Kaid Fran al Qadi landed back in Israel and his family have uh, expressed their gratitude. It's pretty amazing seeing that footage and it certainly gives us some hope and some reason to celebrate, but it's also an important reminder that we need all the hostages back. Absolutely. There's still 106 there and uh, you've been to Israel, as I have uh, this year, to, to see the trauma and anguish that's, that, these, yeah. that these families are going through. What an extraordinary rescue. One man was just on his own that the, the Israelis found. Uh, just fantastic news, but there's still 106 to go. I mean, why... Why aren't these demonstrators at Cornell, by the way, yelling, you know, free the hostages? Yeah. Uh, it, it, you know, what we've seen in the Middle East is Hamas and in Gaza. Hamas use innocent Palestinians as human shields. That's all they are. They're just fodder. They're just fodder. That's why they hide in people's homes. They hide in hospitals and schools and under them. And uh, the Palestinians who've been killed uh, are just... Uh, this is Hamas's fault and nobody else's fault. Uh, but wonderful to see this person... Um, Wonderful to see this person, um, you know, rescued after all these after all these months, Gab. Just your thoughts on how this is all Hamas's fault. Is that uh, your response to to the news today that at least ten Palestinians were killed in a major operation by Israeli forces in the north of the West Bank? Uh, Israeli security forces said that they'd begun a counterterrorism operation. What, what's your response? Well, what's clear now from all the international press is that Iran are funneling weapons through um, intermediary countries, uh, Iraq and Syria, through to um, these Palestinian activists uh, on the West Bank. And uh, they're arming them as much as they can to create more strife for Israel. And as always, Israel has to defend itself against Palestinian terrorism. And that's exactly what they're doing, whether it's coming from Hezbollah, whether it's coming from Hamas, from Hamas, um, from Islamic Jihad, uh, from elements of Fatah in the West Bank, Israel's got to defend itself. And as usual, innocent Palestinians get killed because we see these militants hiding out in people's homes. That's what these people do. Uh, you know, Yaya Sinwa famously said not so long ago, was reported as saying, well, you know, these, uh, these innocent Palestinians get killed. That's just, you know, part of the game we play. You know, that's if they get killed, it's, it's helpful to Hamas because it creates outrage in the West and uh, outrage amongst these, you know, ignorant young students at uh, Cornell and other universities. So, of course, Israel has to defend itself when, when the Janine, you know, camp is not that far from Tel Aviv. I mean, it's a very small country. And, of course, Israel has to defend itself. It has no choice. Mm. And finally, the Israeli military launched what it called a preemptive strike against Hezbollah in Lebanon just a few days ago as the Iran-backed militant group said it carried out its own attacks in response to the killing of a top commander. How much longer can Hezbollah fight back while so many of its leaders have been killed? 
Well, for quite a long time, it has a huge amount of weaponry. And uh, when one leader gets killed, someone else comes along, which is why, as we all know, you'll never wipe out Hamas. And Netanyahu knows that. But uh, what he's trying to say to the Israeli population is, we'll kill as many of these terrorists as we can. But he knows, like we all know, that they'll never be extinguished. Like Nazis have never been extinguished. Um, there are still Nazis around the world, as we know. So um, what Israel wants is to get a peaceful resolution of the situation with Hezbollah in Lebanon, um, but they have a huge number of rockets. They have a massive armory. But of course, they've got to be careful because the, the Lebanese population don't particularly like Hezbollah, who are in the south of the country, just north mm. of the Israeli border. So the, the Le Lebanese population are tiring of Hezbollah. Um, they're there by courtesy of the you know, Syria, of their Lebanese government, but they're, they're getting sick of Hezbollah. I mean, why, why does the average Lebanese person want to have these terrorists, uh, you know, south of, of the Latani River. They don't want them there, uh, but they're still there, supported by Iran. So they'll go on as long as they're armed by Iran and as long as the Lebanese population will tolerate them. And uh, they must be straining out, 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 you know, outstaying their welcome because uh, they're not bringing any joy to Lebanon, which is a country now in, with a severe economic crisis. Michael Kroger, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure, Gab. Prince Harry is set to release the paperback edition of his memoir, Spare, but readers looking for even more royal secrets will be disappointed. Riley Sullivan is a reporter here at skynews.com.au and he joins us in the studio. Riley, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm good. Tell us about the new version of Spare. So we're not going to learn anything new, is that right? Mm, so finally, two years later, we're getting the paperback version of Spare. Um, but as you said, there will be no new information at all. It's a complete reprint of the hardback edition. And this has really taken publishing, um, you know, publishing insiders by surprise because generally um, when you're publishing a paperback edition, you do add new chapters and mm. epilogue, even something short maybe at the start, discussing the book, discussing the publication of the book. Um, and there's none of that. There's not even a new photo for the cover. So it's that classic headshot of Harry that we all know very well now. Um, and it's going to be a complete retread. So a little bit disappointing, I think, for people who are looking for more royal gossip, looking for more royal secrets, yeah. but I think a massive relief for the royal family. Maybe he's exhausted them all. Mm. Or maybe he's trying, maybe he's on his lesson and mm. he doesn't want to reveal even more and... Uh make some more money off selling secrets. But mm. look, speaking of books, this week the Royal Foundation revealed that a charity cookbook Meghan Markle created five years ago as mm. a working royal is continuing to raise thousands of pounds for charity. How did this book come about and is there a sign that this there could be potentially a bit of life left in Meghan's personal brand? Mm. I thought this was a really interesting update. So the Royal Foundation, they've released their sort of annual report looking at um, funds that have been raised and, and it was this cookbook and um, it was actually published about five years ago of course when Megan was still a working royal way back in 2018 which seems crazy but that's already been five years um, and that was published around the time um, not long after the unfortunate tragedy at Greenfield Tower when unfortunately a lot of people passed away and, and this was Megan's big initiative that she really spearheaded herself. She worked with women who were affected by that tragedy. They came together, they shared their recipes, they shared their culture in this cookbook and, and it was very popular at the time but it's continued to sell. So um, it's raised something like £80,000 this year alone for charity and okay. I think it's a really wonderful legacy for Megan. You know, obviously there's so much controversy around the Sussexes yeah. nowadays you know, now that they're not working royals. But I think it's just disappointing because it goes to show that when she was in the royal family, in the institution, you know, part of it, she was doing really good work. Prince William and Prince Harry are both scheduled to be in New York at the same time next month for separate events, though. Mm -hmm. What do you think is going to happen? Is there any hope that they'll actually be meeting face to face? Right. Well, you know, as as is expected, um, people are already excited about this trip. They're speculating that maybe William and Harry could meet up in New York. Look, they're there for completely different events. William's there for his Earthshot Prize charity, which is the signature foundation for the Prince of Wales. Harry is also going to be taking meetings because it's um, during the UN Climate Week. So it's a very important week. It's a very busy week. I personally don't believe we'll see them together. I think that um, they are estranged. I think that, you know, there's been opportunities when Harry's been in London over the past 12 months yeah. for them to meet, and they never have. So, unfortunately, I don't believe that we'll be seeing Harry and William hanging out in New York. Well, I, I have to agree with you, but we'll wait and see. You never mm, know. You never know. Sarah Ferguson has broken her silence on possibly being evicted from the Royal Lodge alongside her ex-husband, Prince Andrew. What did she have to say about this? Mm, so, as, um, as we often discuss on this show, there's constant speculation that 
Prince Andrew will be evicted from Royal Lodge. And of course, he shares that home with his ex-wife, Sarah Ferguson. And, and, and she is out there. She's in the media a lot. She's always doing interviews. And, and someone finally put it to her. They asked her point blank, you know, what do you think about these reports that you and Andrew are going to be evicted? And at first she sort of danced around the question, but the interviewer, I have to credit them, they did, they did follow up and they said, you know, how are you feeling about this? And she was very kind of melancholy. She said, look, I take every day as it comes. So even though she didn't, you know, necessarily address it directly, that's a very vague answer. I think that goes to show um, that there's certainly smoke where, you know, mm. excuse me, where there's smoke, there's fire with Absolutely. this whole Royal Lodge situation. Because, you know, if... If there was no truth in the whole Royal Lodge eviction story, she could have easily just said, that's not true, we're there, this is our home, it's been our home for 20 years. But she didn't. She refused to sort of um, discuss it. But, you know, we say, we talk about these royals as if, you know, they're being evicted from their home, that they could be homeless. And realistically, Sarah Ferguson, we know, owns a $5 million home in Belgravia. Um, Andrew also has other properties. So I don't think that they're exactly going to be um, on the street if they leave Royal Lodge. But... We'll see. I, I have a feeling that they'll be out within the year. Interesting. Yeah, I think they'll be okay. <laughs> well said, <laughs> Riley Sullivan. Thank you so much for joining Great us. Great to see you. That is Power Hour. Thank you for your company. We'll see you next week. Make sure you subscribe to Sky News Australia on YouTube.